This is Information Service Engineering, Lecture Number 7, Knowledge Graphs, Part 2. This now finally is the section in the lecture when we address knowledge graphs directly. You might have already realized we are talking about knowledge graphs now for several sections of the lecture. However, we never really defined it and we're addressing a single or dedicating a single chapter to exactly this kind of topic. Okay, so let's talk about knowledge graphs. So if we look, for example, at the Gartner hype cycle, you can learn something already about knowledge graphs. So I guess you all know the Gartner hype cycle. So this is rather interesting because it tells you about every new and innovative technology that enters here the market or the attention of the public. Um, you, what Gartner does is they try to put them on a specific graph, so on this curve of a so-called hype cycle. And this hype cycle usually starts with an innovation trigger where everybody has really high, high hopes. And you see here that these hopes, of course, these expectations, they rise, they rise, they rise until they reach a kind of peak. And this is the peak of so-called inflated expectations. And then everybody realizes, oh my God, yeah, we, we, we thought so much of that technology and it would be so good and it would help for all of the problems of mankind, but probably it doesn't. So you go down again until you reach the throw of disillusionment. And then if you have reached the button here, then slowly there comes enlightenment, which means, yeah, now you get a better perspective and realization of exactly that kind of technology. And you race slowly over the slope of enlightenment until you reach finally the plateau of productivity. This is the point in time when exactly this kind of technology can be applied in a productive way. Okay. Uh, what you also see here, this kind of uh, technologies, and this cycle is from 2019, so it's already two years old. Uh, the 2021 doesn't exist. I will show you the 2020 later on. Uh, just for explanation, these colors also indicate here, for example, gray indicates that the time to reach the plateau will be two to five years, and yellow means that the plateau will be reached in five to 10 years. And as you can see here, already here are the knowledge graphs and they have risen rather high already in 2019 according the expectations reaching the plateau or the peak of inflated expectation in five to ten years from now so this was in 2019 so you see knowledge graphs as a topic are on the rise and are rather important if we look at the 2020 hype cycle of course there are completely different technologies here available knowledge graphs are not here exactly on the hype cycle curve. However, what we see here are ontologies and graphs, and of course, knowledge graphs also are graphs related to ontologies. So they belong exactly here and they already have reached uh, the throw of disillusionment and already reached, uh, almost reached here also, um, let's say uh, the, 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 the bottom and soon they will rise on the slope of enlightenment to reach the plateau of productivity. And telling you, I'm working now with ontologies for, I would say 15 to 20 years now, and also with knowledge graphs for a rather long time. However, the term knowledge graph is not as old as you think. So before knowledge graphs were termed or named knowledge graphs, this was introduced by the famous Google blog article in 2012, before that, we simply were relating to semantic web technology or semantic technologies when we were referring to these kind of knowledge graphs. Okay, but you see, it has relevance, the topic that we are doing here in the lecture. And therefore, I also want to define now for you what is a knowledge graph. So we try a kind of definition. And of course, we will put a lot of things in it that, of course, all relates to knowledge graph. So a knowledge graph, first of all, is a graph. And it consists of many things. So not only like we have here in the semantic web based knowledge graph classes and instances, besides classes, we might also have abstract concepts. So a graph consisting of concepts, classes, then you have properties of these classes, you have relationships between these classes and you might have entity descriptions. And um, basically a knowledge graph 
reference the term knowledge graph simply because it's based on a formal knowledge representation like for example semantic web technology rdfs and owl and the data that you see there can but does not have to be open so it can be open like for example in dbpedia or wikidata to knowledge graphs we will address then also in the next lectures they can be private like for example in, in a supply chain or they might be closed like product models the data itself can be original data it can be derived from somewhere it can be aggregated from many sources and we distinguish usually instance data data about instances kind of ground truth and then we have schema data which are our vocabularies and ontologies so this is the schema behind and we also differentiate here metadata in the sense that of course we might need provenance information so who stated which fact when we need versioning information so is this fact still valid we need licensing information can this fact be accessed by everybody and under which conditions so then taxonomies usually as part of the ontologies that are underlying the knowledge graphs they are used to categorize the entities and you have links between internal and external data here in the knowledge graph including mapping to data stored in other systems and databases and most importantly since this is a rather important and popular term nowadays it's fully compliant to the fair data principles you have heard about fair data fair stands for findable accessible interoperable and reusable of course this is the ideal that we want to reach also for our data and knowledge graphs are one of the tools that you can use to enable fair data okay but we will come back to this point later on so let's continue our definition you see a knowledge graph is data or it's a data set and this data set can be structured so in the form of specific data structures it can be normalized consisting of small units such, such as vertices and edges and most of all it's connected so it's defined by the possibly distant connections between these objects which are represented within the knowledge graph moreover typically knowledge graphs are almost explicit which means they are created purposefully with an intended meaning they are declarative this means meaningful in itself independent of a particular implementation or algorithm they are or might be annotated which means enriched with contextual information to record additional details and metadata like the provenance information the license information and so on they are not purely hierarchical so they are non-hierarchical it's a network so it's more than just a tree structure and many of these knowledge graphs are really large so they have millions rather than hundreds of elements in it and of course as you see here all already here on the right side this of course is the web of data so linked open data and all of these small bubbles that you see here they are not only data set they are knowledge graphs these are single knowledge graphs interconnected in the web of data talking about the web of data which is basically a web of knowledge graphs you have all of the linked data and linked open data in there and um, according to the last counts from 2017 we have roughly 10,000 data sets with 150 billion facts and roughly 800 million links in between them and of course how are knowledge graph used they are used for example to annotate and interconnect for example other kind of documents with each other and by that by interconnecting you know these documents that you have there with entities and thereby also with classes in the knowledge graph what you do there is you interconnect these documents based on their content and this enables truly content-based semantic search this is also one of the application we will focus on in the application chapter the final chapter here in the lecture and there you will see how semantic search or exploratory search really works based on these kind of knowledge graphs of course the data in the knowledge graph usually obeys the linked data principle which means all of the things that are represented there they use URIs as names for things and you use HTTP URI so that people can look up those names in a meaningful way and if you look it up 
Then of course you provide useful information using the W3C standards like RDF and Sparkle. And of course, most importantly, you include links to other URIs so that you are able to discover more things overall. And we have already heard about that. Thinking about linked data, we also have to consider what are the advantages if I represent my data in terms of knowledge graph based on linked data. And then of course, you have a simple and generic API, not, not a proprietary API, which has to be changed probably again and again and again with you know each changes in the data providers. No, you have a simple and generic API for various heterogeneous data sources, and this enables reuse and data sharing. So it's already two of the FAIR principles among applications. Moreover, the data RDF data model guarantees simple extensibility. Usually in an ontology, we would learn that everything what we specify, it's a model, it's under-specified, it's not exactly reality, and we can all again and again extend it and put more things in it, make it more specific, considering more special cases and stuff like that. In traditional data structures, this always means I have to redefine the schema, I have to adapt all of my applications. This is not necessary if you are following here the uh, open world and the uh, linked open data principles. The nice thing with knowledge graphs following the W3C standards is that the transport of this data simply is uh, achieved via HTTP, the hypertext transfer protocol, we already know that, via a standard port, via port 80, this is the standard web port. So this means firewalls don't have to be adapted. And your ontologies that are in the back, they enable meaningful connections between your data sources. And this means reasoning over linked data enables to generate new knowledge. So you can uh, co conduct inferences from implicit to explicit knowledge, but we know that already. I'm only emphasizing this because these are really, really important things and for a reason you should remember them. What we have to ask ourselves is okay. So we see or we say that all of these data sets, all of these knowledge graphs that are connected here within the web of data, they should link to each other. But how are they interconnected? I mean, one typical thing would be that you have information about a specific entity in different knowledge graphs, which means this entity resides in two knowledge graphs and you have to make clear, yeah, this is the same like the one in the other. So you have to have a connection which indicates that these two entities are the same. The same holds for classes. So you also want to say that one class is equivalent to another class in another knowledge graph. So this is basically equivalent. And for that, of course, you need kind of vocabularies. So these vocabularies are again ontologies and you need ontologies to bind them together. So ontologies is what keeps the web of data together. You see here a selection of te uh, technologies or ontologies that are used to interconnect data within the web of data. And um, one of the most important is, of course, the OWL web ontology language. We will learn about that in one of the next lectures. And there are two vocabulary words that are really important, functional words. One is OWL same as. This connects identical individuals, as I mentioned before. And you have OWL equivalent class. This is a property which connects equivalent classes across different vocabularies, across different knowledge graphs. So this is really important. And this is or are one, two of the most important, let's say, um, two of the most important vocabulary parts that we need. Um, simple example, you have here Joseph Fourier. And if you want to indicate that Joseph Fourier in the knowledge base Wikibeta is the same Joseph Fourier in Wikidata, where it has another name. So the URI of Joseph Fourier in Wikidata is Q8772. You simply put the property all the same as in between them. And then you have the triple DBR, standing for Wikipedia resource, Joseph Fourier. All same as is exactly the same entity as WD Q8772 in Wikidata. There are more interesting ontologies. We only want to look at one further or one more technology, which is GOS, the Symbol Knowledge Organization System. This again is a vocabulary based on RDF and RDFS, and it's used for definition and mappings of vocabularies and ontologies. What you define there, you can define, of course, something like a class, but here it's referred to as GOS concept. 
And this is a bit more broader than the usual classes we are dealing with because a concept can also be something which cannot be instantiated. However, it can also be a class. So this is more broad. And the connection between these concepts, for example, is via the two properties SCOS narrower and SCOS broader, indicating that you connect one class to another one, which is a bit narrower, which means more specific, or you connect one class with another class, which is a bit broader. So this means more general. This is similar to subclass relationship. However, it's not a real subclass relationship because it, so it's mathematically not exactly the same. It only tells you if something is more specific or more generic, not that it's really from a set theoretic point of view and an, a real subclass. And you have another uh, connector here. This is cost related. This only is, of course, means that this and the other thing you connect with the property related is somehow related without specifying exactly what that means. And then if it comes to telling, you know, an instance to match with another instance, like with owl same as, you have something which is a SCOS exact match. This tells you, yeah, this is exactly the same thing, or it's a narrow match. Yeah, this is the same, but a bit more specific. And you say broad match. Yeah, this is the same, but the term you are connecting here is a bit more general. And therefore you have broad match. And then you have also a related match, which is, yeah, this, can be yeah considered the a match but of course it's only related so it's not so specific it's not exact it's not more narrow it's not more broad it's it's different but you can say this is a related match however it's not a perfect match you see this is kind of fuzzy however it's rather useful to have these kind of connectors between single knowledge graphs, between different vocabularies to really then interconnect and um, enable interoperability and data integration, which is really one of the most important things we are after. Let's have a look at a few popular publicly available knowledge graphs. So for example, DBpedia, we have already talked about that or Wikidata. There are other ones, so like Yago, for example, OpenPsych or Nell. And this statistics is not the newest one. You see here the versions that have been considered are from around 2016, 2017. However, as you see here, they are rather large. So they have millions of instances. They have sometimes billions of axioms. So they are really huge. And you see here also how often new versions of these kind of knowledge graphs are relieved. One thing, Wikidata is of course uh, a special case. This is really live because there the users are able to maintain, to update, to change the knowledge graph directly. But we will talk about that in a later part of the lecture. If you look at the timeline of these knowledge bases, these publicly available knowledge bases, everything started with the invention of Wikipedia, which is now 20 years ago in 2001. By that time, already the first of these knowledge graphs, OpenPsych, started in 2002. And then the Wikipedia-based knowledge graphs, like for example, Freebase or Iago, have already created in 27 or 2008. Like DBpedia, also based on Wikipedia, has started in 2007. And you see here the Google knowledge graph entered the stage at around 2012, at the same time like Wikidata became here an interesting uh, knowledge graph. And of course, uh, time is fleeing and all the things are developing and growing. And there are not only these uh, publicly available data sets or publicly available knowledge graphs, of course, there are also proprietary knowledge graphs, commercial knowledge graphs, which are maintained inside companies, inside the industry. And they often are much larger than the publicly available knowledge graph. So Microsoft has, of course, a knowledge graph. And here the size is only estimated around 2 billion primary entities, 55 billion facts. So this is really huge and it's actively used here already in Microsoft products. Google, who has introduced the knowledge graph in 2012, there the knowledge graph also has around a billion entities and 70 billion assertions, statements in that. So this is also really, really much. Facebook, 50 million primary entities, 500 million assertions. eBay, around 100 million products, 1 billion triples. 
also a lot. Oh, IBM and IBM maintains various knowledge graphs for different products and sizes. So these are only a few examples. Most of the companies today or most of the e-commerce platforms, they all maintain knowledge graphs. Most of the information systems like search engines, they all use knowledge graphs to improve their search, to enable their uh, perfectly uh, matched search results and stuff like that. So this is technology that is used on an everyday basis. And also, of course, it's rather interesting to use this probably in your application probably you cannot directly access proprietary knowledge graphs but there are open knowledge graphs on the web and in the next lectures we will have a look especially on dbpedia and wikidata as two popular open knowledge graphs and more importantly what we will look at is a query language and this is the sparkle query language which enables us also to tackle such a, such a gigantic knowledge graph like wikidata for example like you see here on that old picture, the whale. So you can query Wikidata, the huge knowledge graph with a little Sparkle query and can extract exactly the data you are looking for. But this you will see then in the next lecture.